Good afternoon, everyone. I am Krista Sineski. I am a marketing director at Eloquest Healthcare, and we are so pleased to have you here today for our very first Wednesday workshop. Uh, the format of this session is designed to give you quick, actionable tips and resources from clinical experts, all with the goal of improving outcomes in your facilities. Today, we have an exceptional but brief 20-minute presentation for you delivered by notable infection prevention expert, Michelle Shelley DeVries. Uh, this is the first in a three-part series, which is entitled Vascular Access Jamboree, a how-to guide. Uh, today, Shelley will be sharing a bit about her Jamboree model used in her facility that they've had some success with and some tips on how to get one started in your very own facility. I know some of you may, are already well acquainted with our presenter, but I do wanna take a minute to give her a proper introduction. Uh, Shelly DeVries has been involved in infection prevention and hospital epidemiology for more than 25 years, spanning community, university, and federal healthcare facilities. She is particularly passionate about raising awareness and around peripheral vascular access devices and quality improvement, so much so that she's pausing her vacation to be here today to provide education on this very topic. Um, she was a reviewer for the 2016, as well as the recently released 2021 Infusion Therapy Standards of Practice. She's also authored the infection prevention chapter for the next edition of the Infusion Nursing and Evidence-Based Approach to test book, Textbook. And she's also, also authored the Vascular Access Associated Infections chapter for the International Federations of Infection Control Textbook. And she's authored numerous peer-reviewed journal uh, articles. Additionally, she's an adjunct research fellow for AVATAR, the Alliance for Vascular Access Te Teaching and Research. And she also serves the Association for Vascular Access, both nationally on their board of directors and locally uh, serving as co-president of her local network, Hoosier Band. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming our very first Wednesday workshop presenter, Shelley DeVries. Thank you, Krista, and good afternoon, everyone. I am so excited to have a chance to briefly talk with you today about the Vascular Access Jamboree that takes place monthly at my organization. A final piece of housekeeping, I always do need to say, as Krista mentioned, I am part of the Board of Directors with the Association for Vascular Access, so I do need to make it clear that the views presented today are mine and mine alone and do not represent those of AVA unless otherwise stated. So with that behind us, as a starting point for our polling question, does someone in your facility have responsibility for routinely performing bedside audits for vascular access devices? So yes, it's infection control. Yes, it's a vascular access specialist. Yep, someone does it, but not vascular access or IP, but no, but I'd like to see us start. So Stephanie, if you could go ahead and launch that poll. Awesome. Um, wow, this is really great information. And I love to see the blend of what's going on out there. And I'm super excited to see those of you who are not currently doing it, having an interest in getting started. And I hope uh, this brief series of webinar sessions will help give you the information you need to consider what might work for you. So like so many things we do, getting started truly is the hardest part. The following questions are what we're going to talk through today, establishing clear goals and definitions, figuring out which roles to invite to your vascular access jamboree, review some of the needed tools and resources that we have found very helpful in helping us be successful, how we go about, uh, go about gaining consensus when we're out rounding on the floors, some of the scheduling considerations we've had. So, if a vascular access jamboree is a new concept to you, you're not alone because this is something that we launched and we were learning as we went. So I can take no credit for this definition, but I think it is absolutely fabulous and it truly captures what it is we're trying to accomplish. So vascular access jamboree for us is a large festive <laughs> gathering that includes nursing unit leadership, infection prevention, professional development, and industry partners. Where we're collectively performing bedside rounding, and we're documenting those observations with the goal of improving patient care. As we've launched it in my organization, it's actually a monthly opportunity to partner around best practice for the patients. 
And as I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear, we did have to take a hiatus um, during much of last year when we were faced with our, our COVID experiences and everything that went along with that. But we are back live and we have had several jamborees already in 2021. So roles to invite. For us, the concept of a vascular access jamboree really launched after an extended period of time where myself and my incredible partner, Dr. Nancy Scott, um, an infection preventionist who's part of my team, we were out rounding and we were feeding information back to nursing leadership and throughout administration of the organization. And we were taking advantage of many point prevalence offerings that our industry partners shared, but we were missing something because there were so many pieces to the puzzle, so many complexities in the observations we were having and the opportunities for improvement we realized that having everyone together at one time, both from the hospital and from all the components of our vascular access bundles, that we could probably make the most efficient use of time and accelerate improvements at the bedside. So for us, our hospital team for our monthly jamboree includes infection prevention. Uh, it is led by myself and Dr. Nancy Scott. We're infection preventionists with a passion for vascular access our key partners and, and the individuals who help us thread our findings throughout organization for both education, policy development, and anything else that needs to go into it, are our professional development team and our clinical nurse specialists. We always invite and encourage our vascular access team to join us, obviously, at the bedside nursing leadership. We engage with the bedside staff um, throughout our rounding process so we can hear their experiences um, as we make our observations and then we report through quality and patient safety so they're absolutely invited and engaged in our process. So then when it comes to industry, we invite both product representatives, the nursing or clinical specialists, we've had executives and product engineers at the bedside with us so that we can best learn how to optimize outcomes with all of the products and how we can work together to achieve the outcomes of improved patient safety. So the folks we include, we always invite our catheter manufacturers for our central lines, our peripheral lines, our midlines, those that represent our vascular access dressings, our various methods of securement, and then all the adjuncts that go into our bundles, both for peripheral devices and central devices, which for us includes our gum mastic liquid adhesive, our CHG sponge dressings, our alcohol impregnated caps, and then at times we've included the manufacturers of our flush syringes and our TPA so that we can flex to address the opportunities that are presented to us and have an ever evolving way to address opportunities in our organization. So uh, on to another quick poll question um, for all of us, no matter if your performance is exceptional or has opportunities for improvement, reducing collapses remains a top priority for all of us. So reflecting, and this is just an opinion piece, what practices do you think have room for improvement right now in your facility? Here we go. A lot of all of the above. Okay, there we go. All right, I'm not surprised. So I agree with everything that folks have said. We can't forget about hand hygiene, administration set changes. I think some of us have some changes in policy with the new standards and publications, CHG dressings, dressing integrity at 44%. You have come to the right place. And then ultimately, and this is where we are as well, all of the above. Um, after the year, year and a half at this point, we've all had getting back to the basics, getting us back where we need to be with our patient outcomes so that we can continue to provide absolutely excellent care. So thank you for your participation in that poll. So establishing clear goals and definitions. If, if you're moving forward with the concept of a jamboree, at your starting point internally, you need to decide what your focuses are. So identifying what you want to monitor, but then as importantly, how you're going to monitor that. So I share a spreadsheet. It's a snapshot of how we originally captured this data. We've gone through a series of iterations. Originally, this was a homegrown Excel spreadsheet that lived on a shared drive and everyone would dump data into it. We've then experimented with a couple of different um, web-based applications. And what we've currently been able to move forward with is something that fully integrates with our incident reporting system or our risk management system in the hospital. There's no one right way to do it, but regardless of how you do it, understanding what you're hoping to accomplish, how you're going to gather that data, and then creating data dictionaries so that you are consistent with how that information is collected. 
for us in my organization, a monthly vascular access jamboree serves as a sort of inner rate of reliability because we have the ongoing monitoring. And prior to COVID, these same assessments were made at the unit level, and we would get upwards of 2,000 observations a month. So our vascular access jamboree, we tend to get 50 or maybe 100 observations each month but allows us to somewhat validate the internal work that's being done. So identifying what measures you're going to have, creating the data dictionary around what those terminology, what those words mean to you, and then making sure that anyone who is involved in collecting that data is also aware of those definitions so they can be applied consistency, consistently over time, over department, and uh, between the individuals. So needed tools and resources understanding both for your internal group and the larger uh, interdisciplinary collaborative group, why are we here? For us, it is all about the patient, improving those outcomes and identifying each time what we hope to accomplish because that focus may change slightly based on the outcomes or the opportunities we've identified month to month. And part of the beauty about us being able to do this every single month, minus that gap we understandably had during COVID is we can shift our focus, we can pivot our focus and we can bring in additional experts as needed to help us get where we need to be. Because we do involve industry and we partner heavily with industry, it's also important to say what we don't do. So Nancy and I, every single time we get together, even though we have a core group for this, is we start with ground rules. And one of the important things is that we are not here together to sell to our bedside staff or to try to upsell the products we currently use. The Vascular Access Jamboree is not the forum for that. We are here for the patients. So any conversation upstairs on the units at the bedside is focused on improving the care with what we have. We do a debrief afterward and downstairs behind closed door, we can talk about if there may be product interventions, product innovations that are necessary, but that is not the purpose of the rounds and it is absolutely forbidden when we're out talking to the clinical staff. We also have a lot of uh, competitive interests um, because you saw the list of groups we work with outside of our organizations. These may be fierce competitors, but we come together in a beautiful collaborative way where we work together respectfully. And uh, we've actually seen competitive partners working together to develop a more comprehensive education approach that can come forward to our patients. I really hope this is something that we can see even more of if this spreads to other institutions because that kind of collaboration has been so powerful. At the end of the day, it's not a single product that's going to make it or break it for the patient. Everything we bring in needs to work together seamlessly. And the end point is the patient leaving our hospital healthy and without a vascular access complication. And finally, identifying what your data collection tools are going to be. So obtaining consensus. When we do our observations, historically we've broken into a central line team and a peripheral line team, just so we don't overwhelm individual patients. We are a teaching hospital technically, but for our patients, it would still be unusual to see a group of 10 people hovering around their bedside, uh, routinely looking at their vascular access devices. So we break into teams to keep the number of individuals at the bedside at any time manageable. We do direct observations and we always have at least one nurse from our facility who is making the observation and ultimately recording what that finding is. We think it's clear that this is a direct observation at the bedside. This is not based on medical record documentation. We have a discussion of those findings before leaving the unit because we do have a number of clinical experts at the bedside, both our infection prevention team, our professional development, our nursing leadership, but then our industry experts too. And in vascular access, we are so fortunate because our industry partners are likely VABC or CRNI themselves. And even our non-clinical partners often have their industry partner vascular access certification. Everyone's voice needs to be heard, but we wanna make sure we've established consensus before we leave the bedside so that we don't get blindsided by a negative finding that not everyone had the opportunity to review. We do a handoff to bedside staff of anything that requires immediate attention. If we see something that's a potential patient safety concern or something we can improve, we do some just-in-time education. We also make sure that the bedside staff have the information they need to be able to change that, that individual practice. Um, we are very lucky that with the uh, progress we've made that our quality director had brought in for us, this, um, the system we use is integrated into our risk management system and our incident reporting system. So we are able to obtain photos um, as part of this in a compliant manner 
but please, please, please make sure you know and follow your hospital policy on photographing patients. We do get consent and then this is included and our patients know we're going to use it for teaching and education, but it is a very powerful part of what we do and what we've been able to do and uh, continually get better. For scheduling, what we do, this is a monthly occurrence. Um, we alternate facilities. We are one hospital, but we have two full service campuses. And in order to maximize our impact, we alternate campuses each month. Um, I've mentioned that in general, we have a central line team and a peripheral line team. Most recently, we had a relatively small number of central lines uh, in-house one day, which was wonderful. So we instead split into unit-based teams so that we saw both central lines and peripheral line teams with each group while continuing to minimize the number of people at the bedside. Our goal is not to see every single device that's in the hospital, but we do see as many as we can. And in general, like I said, it's usually at least 50 observations. We get sometimes significantly more. The pattern that we've fallen into is about three hours of rounds, so direct observations at the bedside, followed by approximately an hour debrief with the vascular access jamboree team. And we've occasionally been able to have our nursing leadership, or quality leadership or other leaders in the organization join us or call in uh, to hear this information directly. That's the time pattern that's worked for us. That's certainly not set in stone, but it's it's been just about right for us. We do alternate, oops, sorry, I got excited. Uh, we do alternate times of day, days of the week so that we can see uh, as many different uh, scenarios as possible. One more quick polling question and we're just about out of time. So what do you think would be easiest for you if you wanted to launch this? I know we have a significant percentage of people say, yeah, they'd like to get started. What kind of things would make it helpful for you? Stephanie, if we can launch that poll. Looks like they want a suite of templates and tools. <laughs> Great, thanks. And this was just, you know, curious because we've, we've struggled to really optimize What's our best way to, to collect this data and keep it going? So thank you for sharing. Um, so we're not just, what do we say? We're not just talking the talk. We are walking the walk. These are a number of articles that we put out for my organization. Um, Nancy and I wrote for uh, Ava's Intravascular Quarterly, so IQ, our little Jamboree piece, which was just a story because we get so many questions about Jamboree and how to get started. So that was just a simple piece we shared. That's the one on the left published a, a little more comprehensive piece on beyond bean counting, how that we can gather and use data to drive improvements. And just last week, a big quality improvement project went up in JWOCN, which was a lot of that information was gathered during our jamborees, but also 30,000 observations by our bedside staff on our vascular access dressings, which was a huge quality improvement project. And that just hit uh, online uh, last week, and it'll be in print uh, this fall but we really do take this seriously as we move through. Um, there is a checklist that I pulled together just as you start to think about what might work for you. We're gonna get back together again in two weeks to talk about some of the actual data collection, but you can download this. If it's anything you find helpful to start and open a conversation for you before we move into questions, just a reminder, this is part one of three. Um, in two weeks, we'll talk about how we actually collect that data and use it to implement change. And then our third and final session will be on post-implementation monitoring. And so today was just our first taste or touch of our vascular access jamboree. And uh, Stephanie and Kristen, I think we can open for questions. Thank you so much, Shelly. I appreciate the uh, information-packed 20-minute uh, presentation. Thank you so much. So to our audience, this does conclude the, the formal presentation port, and now is the opportunity for you to submit your specific questions uh, for Shelly. So please go ahead and type those into the question box, um, and we'll try to get through as many as we can in the next few minutes that we have. We do already have a few questions coming in. Um, so Shelly, I'll just, I'll start firing away. How can infection prevention collaborate more with bedside nurses and managers for CLABC prevention? Oh, I love that question. So as an infection preventionist myself, for us, what we've really found is we don't want to chase infections and report infections. Obviously, we have to do that, but we want to prevent the infection. So 
This concept of collaborative rounding came about because originally it was the infection prevention team going out and doing what we called and still call process measures, because we know if we can fix the processes, the outcomes will follow. And from there, our administrations are actually the ones who took that from being just a task of the infection prevention team to something that the individual units had ownership and expectations for as well. The uh, 2021 infusion therapy standards of practice, which we'll talk about more at our next session, have a lot of information about quality improvement, individual accountability, and having a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary plan in doing so. So we'll talk about that a little bit more, but I would really look at that quality improvement standard, standard six in the 2021 infusion therapy standards of practice to help kind of move that collaboration forward. Sorry to be short, but trying to respect the, respect the timelines. No, thank you so much, appreciate it. Um, okay, so this one I am paraphrasing a little bit, but how do you recommend going about getting um, buy-in to addressing a problem um, from the staff, particularly in the high stress state of exhaustion that nurses are currently experiencing. Yeah, I do think um, it is tough and being respectful. We have just come out of a year and a half and, and quite honestly, we're not out of it yet of struggles that I don't think any one of us could have imagined seeing in the U.S. or global healthcare system. So I hear your sensitivity there and I share it. The truth is right now, our outcomes matter more than ever. Um, our patients always deserve the best possible care and no one should come to the hospital and die or suffer from a vascular access complication. What we have right now is CMS value-based purchasing. We had a reprieve from that in the first half of 2020, but public reporting and uh, penalty ramifications are in place. And this year, in order to meet value-based purchasing, our CLABS the outcomes need to be 40% better than they're predicted to be. So that's a large impetus. There's a significant ramifications for our organizations when we don't meet those metrics. So using that as a starting point, looking at we're more than halfway through the year right now, and if you are not achieving those outcomes, it's time to look at the processes or the processes and see where your opportunities are. And also that's so strongly supported by the infusion therapy standards of practice. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. Use the standards to drive your practice and you will find support for these types of activities to actually analyze, aggregate, do surveillance, assess and make improvements. And if you're not doing that, not only are we failing our patients, we're failing to meet the standards of practice. I hope that answered the question, sorry. Yes, yes, and again, continue to type in the questions that you have uh, to our audience members. Um, so one more question for you, uh, I guess a logistical question, who enters the data that is collected during your rounds? <laughs> Nancy, did you submit that question? I know my, I know my partner, my secret sauce is on. So um, that, that is probably one of the most tedious sections of this. Um, prior to switching to apps, we would round for three hours and Nancy and I would sit at computers and spend about three hours putting it into the spreadsheet. Right now in our organization, that primary responsibility is one that we have absorbed in uh, infection prevention as the leads and as part of the quality program. Um, we have tried now that it's app-based to have some of our partners uh, who are with us on the rounds actually enter as we go. Um, it's much more efficient to do so, but we are an ever-evolving work in process. Um, in our team, in our department, we don't have clerical support. It is something that could easily be done um, by, by clerical support. It's just not something we have available to us. But now that we're using the apps more and more, it's much more efficient if we do it as we go. But, but yes, you, you do touch on something that is, uh, there is a data entry burden and it's not insubstantial. But the powerful information we receive back is, is worth that investment in time. <clears throat> Yeah, and I imagine with uh, some of your vendor support, they can uh, assist with some of the data tabulation, depending on what you're, um, you're measuring as well. Um, as yep. you flashed by what you were, your facility is recording during your rounding, um, you did, it did indicate that dressing integrity is one area that you're uh, monitoring. Um, with regard to this, how do you handle dressings that have been reinforced with tape? <laughs> I love that question. 
So um, yes, dressing integrity has been a major quality improvement focus for us for several years now. Um, we've presented that data a number of times at National AVA and our article on improving dressing integrity is actually referenced in the 2021 infusion therapy standards of practice. And that is the article that I shared that was just, uh, just put up online recently. So nowhere in the standards of practice, is there anything that supports the use of food reinforcement of dressings? And actually in the standards of practice, they do discourage the use of tape, recognizing that it can be non-sterile or it can be uh, contaminated. So we truly are a thou shalt not reinforce hospital because it's impossible to tell if a piece of tape of any kind has been put over a dressing to prevent it from disrupting, or if we fail to follow the standards of practice, which actually say if a dressing is loose or dislodged or lifted along the board or anywhere in the transparent, it needs to be changed immediately per the standards. So we do not support reinforcement of our dressing. We teach not to reinforce um, for that very reason, but we do leave a place within our electronic medical records so that if something has been re be re if it has been reinforced, the nurse can document that the dressing is reinforced, or if it is loosened, that they can mark that it needs to be monitored. So we do not routinely remove those dressings, but it is against our expectations that dressings be reinforced. I know that it's kind of a circuitous answer, but I hope I hope that got to the core of what you were looking for. We we by policy do not reinforce dressings in our system. Great, thank you so much. Well, we did have some really Im information-packed questions and a lot of good information. We are at our time limit. Um, so thank you so much, Shelly. As I said, I know you're pausing your, your time away from your, your family and your vacation to be here and provide this education today. We really appreciate it. And to our audience members, um, on behalf of all of us at Eloquest Healthcare, we really appreciate your attending our first Wednesday workshop. And as Shelly indicated, um, please join us again in two weeks for the next in the series, which is Collecting Data and Implementing Change, July 28th, 2 p.m. Eastern. And two weeks following that, we'll reconnect again on Wednesday, August 11th uh, for post-implementation monitoring. And thank you all for your time, and we hope to see you again in two weeks. Thanks. Bye.